Who started the recording of the teams? Somebody started it. Did I start it? Oh, okay, whoever started, whoever started it, thank you. But don't, I mean, if, if somebody else starts it, and when I stop it, there would be some problem. So instead of starting yourself, let me, let me do it, okay? Just remind me that I am not, I am not recording a lecture. Okay. Sure. By the way, there is two different meetings going on at the same time right now. Uh, some people join the other meeting. So tell them, tell them that this is the meeting. Why, why are there two meetings? One is a Monday yes. meeting. One is a Tuesday meeting. Did they join this the a, Monday meeting? This is not. The, this is not the Tuesday meeting. This is a new meeting, uh, unfortunately. Okay, I, I let them know uh, to join this meeting. Is this a new meeting? No, it says that, okay, somebody is doing that, okay. I don't know what happened. Since I changed the, Okay, let's wait for the other people to join this meeting. Yeah, it looks like there are two meetings going on. So I guess we got everybody right now. So how many people are there? 128, okay, good. So two more than yesterday. Uh, uh, for the newcomers, I am sorry, uh, there was a problem with the meetings. I think I mixed it up, I, I messed it up. I was trying to uh, change the date, the time for the meeting from 10.30 to 11.30 and somehow we have two meetings right now. Okay, I hope everybody joined it. Okay, so I didn't say anything new, actually I was repeating whatever I said yesterday. Two, two, two reasons why we are using operating systems, why we need operating systems. Abstracting away the details of the hardware, also managing the hard resource that is the hardware. Okay, so these are the two reasons. And we talked about this. This is somehow a little bit, uh, how should I say, a little bit um, not correct. I mean, uh, your programs are directly using actually your hardware. I mean, you're directly, you're directly changing your memory locations using the uh, CPU instructions, right? You are directly executing CPU instructions, okay? So operating system doesn't always in the picture, okay? The CPU has... What does the CPU have? Okay, we are going to talk about this in more detail anyway, but CPU, CPU has, okay, uh, CPU has in it registers. One of the registers is, is program counter, right? Program counter. What does the program counter do? Can anybody tell me the function of the program counter? It's execute instruction one by one. Well, CPU executes the instruction one by one. What does the program counter do? It tells you which uh, instruction right now. 
it tells you which instruction you are executing right now, right? I mean, your CPU knows, okay, this is your memory. Okay, memory is like that. Program counter is kind of a pointer that tells you that you are executing this instruction. And how many program counters uh, uh, are there in the CPU? On a regular CPU, not multi-core CPU, not multi uh, process CPU, but a single CPU. How many program counters are there? One. There is only one. A CPU, a regular CPU that we are going to use in this uh, lecture, okay, in this course, contains only a single program counter. That's it, okay? So that means that, that means that uh, the CPU can execute a single instruction at the same time, okay? And it is our instruction. Whatever my I am executing with this a.out, it is being executed. So don't think that operating system is always running, okay, with, with my programs, okay? Operating system is like any other program. Well, it's a special program, but it's like any other program, okay? And it has to wait until the CPU is available to, to use the CPU, okay? Uh, so a.out runs, but when it reads the operating system help, it makes a system call, then operating system comes in and it, it does whatever it needs to do and a.out runs again. Or if a.out is doing something bad like uh, trying to access the virtual memory table or trying to do some uh, input and output, then in that case, CPU lets the operating system know that somebody is doing bad, somebody is doing something bad, okay? so. Uh, we, with the help of the CPU and the other hardware, operating system controls the, the, the whole computer. If I don't have that kind of help, then the job of the operating system would be very difficult. Okay, so we talked about this uh, picture yesterday, and we talked about the abstraction, how does the operating system abstract away the hardware details, and then we talked about the resource management, and we talked about this two types of multiplexing, okay? In space and in time uh, multiplexing. CPU is multiplexed in time. Some other resources such as uh, memory space and the disk space are multiplexed in space, okay? We talked about it. And then and yesterday we talked about uh, the, the notion of the operating system. What's the operating system, okay? Uh, 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 are all the commands such as ls and ps and manual page and uh, uh, g++ are parts of the operating system we say that no because they don't run in the kernel mode they don't run in the privileged mode okay privileged mode is the mode where the cpu is allowed to do anything it likes okay and the kernel is supposed to be in the privileged mode all the other regular all the other regular uh, programs are not supposed to be in the privileged uh, mode. Question for you. Let me open up my fake shell, okay? Suppose this is my, okay, make it smaller a little bit, okay. Is the program LS running in privileged mode? No. No. Any other answers? Selim says no. Maybe, not, not maybe it depends where you run. What do you mean, Bilal? Uh, maybe you are run this command in uh, some directory which uh, you need privilege to access. Well, in that case, when I say uh, uh, in the root directory, when I say ls, well, since this is my computer, I am privileged to access everywhere I like. But as a regular user, if I go to a system directory and try to run LS there, okay, then it's not going to show me anything, I guess, because it's going to tell me that I don't have enough privilege. So LS is not running in the privilege mode in this case, uh, uh, because so LS is not... sudo LS. Does that make it run in the Well, I mean, that, that's a trick. Uh, if you do, okay, super user do, okay, that means that run this program ls in the privilege mode. Yeah, it's a trick that Linux invented. Okay, you may like 
any program uh, uh, you want in the privilege mode not exactly privilege mode but we can say it is privilege mode okay uh, but you need to give your uh, root password for this okay and I'm not going to do that it's kind of uh, uh, dangerous to do that because you may do some bad stuff because there is no limit what you can do with the uh, super user uh, uh, mode okay so the point I am trying to make here is that LS is part of the standard bash shell okay it comes with it shell is part of the operating system we may think but they are not running in the privilege mode so for us as far as we are concerned as the operating system course students and the researchers okay this is not in kernel mode this is not part of the operating system okay so ls and ps and the shells are not part of the operating system let's go back here okay the c shell or gcc or the windowing environment are not part of the operating system because they are not running in the kernel mode because they are not running in the kernel mode okay this is the other picture that i showed yesterday operating system kernel runs in the kernel mode so what is in the kernel mode tell me something okay what is in the kernel mode for linux operating system what is in the kernel mode the implementation of system calls for example what kind of system calls some system calls are not really in this in the in the kernel they are they are handled in the in the in the user space actually not all the system calls not all the system Maybe calls. Drivers? yes exactly drivers yes uh, the drivers are for the linux operating system in the in the in the kernel mode what's a driver driver is the special piece of code that acts as an interface between your program uh, and the hardware and we are going to talk about it there are some operating systems where the drivers are not in the kernel uh, mode they are, they live in the uh, uh, they live in the uh, uh, um, uh, user space user mode okay so driver is a good example or memory management okay memory management or the process management they all are in the kernel mode okay so we will th th this will be clearer when we talk about uh, memory management and the uh, and the process management in the next and the other chapter okay we talked about, about signals signal sender well signals are specific to unix operating system okay and if to, if you are if you are sending a signal to a process you need to make a system call and in that case you need to switch to you need to switch to the kernel mode I see. okay good uh, okay so i mean if if somebody talks about the operating system so I ask you a operating system question always think about the kernel mode i mean uh, sometimes they will ask you things like i mean is this an operating system part of the operating system or is this is this is this is this operating system code and you if you think about the kernel mode then most of the time you will be clear and as you see when i say sometimes drivers are in the kernel mode sometimes not depending on the operating system that means that it all changes right it all changes uh, as as i said yesterday there are some operating systems which are designed in a way that the kernel is very very small okay only maybe 10,000 lines of code that's it that's the kernel so you don't you cannot fit many things in kernel everything is outside of the kernel they say that i keep my kernel small so if there are bugs in the kernel i will minimize it okay i will minimize it so as a rule of thumb people human beings make introduce bugs to the software system one bug per thousand lines okay every thousand lines you introduce a one bug to the system so if you have a kernel of 10,000 lines that means that you will have around 10 bugs for your kernel again it is not bug free but number of bugs is small but if you have a kernel that contains one million lines of code there are there are more than thousand bugs in your kernel that's a bad thing that's what they say okay so we talked about it yesterday and we were talking about the history of the operating system uh, 
As I said yesterday, history is important for the operating systems, for any for any uh, uh, area of the science or technology. Always start studying the history, whatever you do. Okay? Why we why are we using C programming so so heavily? Look at the history. I mean, why 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 Python is Python was invented 15 years ago, but nowadays it is more popular. Okay, why uh, suddenly we started using Python more and more? Just study the history. Okay, let's let's look at the history of the operating systems. So we are going to have uh, first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth and fifth generation. Okay, and it is important to understand why we had those kind of operating systems at those uh, 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 eras of time and why we are having this kind of operating system nowadays, okay? So let's look at the first type of operating systems, 1945 to 55, where we did not have the transistors, okay? We did not have the transistors. In 1945 to 55, all the electronic devices uh, were built using vacuum tubes, okay? The vacuum tubes are very primitive versions of you would say maybe uh, uh, transistors and they are very big okay nowadays we are talking about okay uh, 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 micron level transistors but the size of the size of the vacuum tubes each vacuum tube con corresponds to a transistor you would say okay so it is like two centimeters uh, wide a few centimeters tall, right? Okay, and you need to put thousands of them in a computer, very small computer. Actually, I mean, it is not the computer is not a small, but a very weak computer that can do maybe uh, maybe ten editions per second. Okay, this is like uh, billions of times slower than whatever we have in our hand. It is billions of times slower than uh, this cell phone okay so but uh, uh, th that was that was it so if the computers are this weak they don't have any power computational power okay what did we say operating systems are piece of code right they have to run on the computer we did not have enough resources to run the operating systems so there were no operating systems in those days because uh, uh, running such a complicated software on such a simple hardware was not possible nobody thought about it so the programming a computer means that you have an operator somebody like this she's a special person you gave her the code and she comes at the computer this is ENIAC okay 1940s so she is programming the computer actually so she is dialing in numbers so the, the see these numbers she is dialing in numbers and each number is kind of an instruction and its operands okay so the, they, they don't talk about the compilers there are no compilers okay uh, they don't talk about the assembly actually there is no assembly language all they have is this special machine code remember this uh, i think i showed you maybe did i show you os yeah maybe it is here no it is not here i think it was on classes yeah test static that s maybe that one Okay, so this is the, remember uh, A.out, that, that program A.out, very simple program. Let me show it to you, let me show that to you again. Um, test.c, test.c, this is the simple program. Two local variables and I am making a system called exit minus one, that's it. I disassembled that A.out using, what did I use? I think I used, I used. GCC dash dash s. No 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 no. Like no no. I compiled to a dot out first, then I object dumped it 
to that not as far. This is disassembly. If I, uh, Osama, if I do that, GCC minus S, all I get is this test dot, test dot S. And test dot S is very small, that's, that's it. This one doesn't include the libraries, okay? This one is just an assembly, okay? This is not the machine code part. But if I produce a dot out, and if I uh, object dumped the a dot out to, to the disassembled version, this is what I get. Okay, so on the right side, I have the assembly disassembled version of the machine code. And if I move on, as you see on the right, on the left, I have the machine code actually. So that person there, that, that, that lady, where is that lady? She is dialing in, she is dialing in these numbers here, one by one. And she doesn't know anything about that. Actually, she's not a programmer, she's just an operator, okay? She doesn't know what she's doing actually, okay? She's just dialing in all those numbers. And when all those numbers are dialed in, okay, somebody starts the computer and it does the computation and you look at the memory location for the results. Okay, that was the early computers and with this kind of a system, there is no operating system because you are directly using the old hardware yourself. You are directly using all hardware yourself. And with this computer ENIAC, it was the most powerful computer in those days, a single computer, 1946. There are 17,000 vacuum tubes, okay? And the whole computer consumed this much power, 150 kilowatts of power, okay? Nowadays, nowadays, uh, our uh, uh, most power-hungry PCs are using maybe at most 700 watts. So this is like 200 times more needed more power and also the the computational power of this computer is one billionth of that machine that simple machine so what did they use this for i think they were using this for uh, calculating the trajectories of the trajectories of the bullets for the large guns if i have a large gun a cannon maybe from a ship like that okay if this is my bullet what would be the trajectory of it given the parameters of the uh, the shell uh, the gun the wind and etc okay so they wrote the program for that so it is a bunch of calculations actually numerical calculations so uh, they it made their jobs a lot easier they say that uh, manually it used to take days to make these calculations now they are making this less than an hour, in less than an hour, okay? So the thing is that programming this was very difficult. So you need a special team. You need programmers, okay? You need operators like those. And the thing is that, the thing is that this one can run reliably at most for thousand hours, okay? Every thousand hours, this will be burned, okay? It will go away. It will die. So a thousand hours may look it's okay, but there are seventeen thousand of them. Okay, so that means that every hour you would expect that some of them will go bad. Okay, so that means that every twenty minutes your machine will go down. You need to find the faulty uh, tube, okay, vacuum tube, and you need to change it and you need to continue. And uh, most of the time you need to start from the beginning. That was the case. That was the case between 1945 and 55. So we don't talk about the uh, uh, we don't talk about the operating systems for the first generation computers. We don't talk about the compilers. Maybe maybe later they invented this 1950s. I think they invented the assemblies assembly language. Okay, you give the assembly language. And computer translates that assembly language to its own machine code. So somebody realized that we could use computers to help write better programs. Okay, that was unheard of that day. Okay, 
uh, the, the, to, to use a computer means that changing these dials, many of them. Okay, as you see, there is one panel here, another panel there, another panel behind it. Okay, that that was how you how you how you did that. Okay, uh, this is University of Pennsylvania in 1940s. Then we have the second generation. Somebody at the AT&T AT and Labs, okay, Bell Labs, invented the transistor. Okay, that was a very big invention, very influential invention. After that invention, the whole world has changed. The transistor defines what we are doing today, okay? Everything depends on the transistor. Transistor is doing kind of the same job. What is the function of the transistor? Can somebody tell me? Can somebody tell me the function of the transistor in a single, in a single sentence? Not very long sentence. Takes a current and based on its uh, value, it directs it either to one direction or the other. Yeah, you could say that. That's exactly. It is controlling the current with another current. Okay. This is your, let's say, this is your transistor. And the electricity, if you, if you, I mean, this is a very, very simplification, actually. It comes from this direction, and it, it comes from there, and it goes there. This is our transistor. There is a control current here. If you apply it, there will be, there will be electric flow. If you don't apply it, there, will, there won't be any flow. It's like the, it's like the, it's like the, uh, it's like the, uh, the, the water pipe control, okay? Uh, you have a faucet and you are doing this uh, left and right thing and you are letting the current uh, go or not go, okay? That's, that's, that's what this do and that's what we do with the transistors, okay? So you are controlling the flow of the electricity with other electrical sin signals, okay? And uh, we, uh, using, the <clears throat> using the semiconductor technology, I can do this using a very small amount of power, okay and using very small amount of uh, material and i can make this very 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 small much smaller than these and it will become more reliable so second generation computers okay second generation computers they started using they started using in these areas 55 to 65 they started using these transistors once you start using transistors that means that your computers are more reliable. Now I can sell computers. I can commercialize it. Okay. So the big computer companies like IBM, okay, uh, started uh, those days building computers, mainframes. Okay. Let's look at those computers now. Okay. Second generation computers. So the input to the computer, input to the computer is not like this anymore. Instead, they said that, okay, they said that, let's use punch cards. Okay, let me show you a punch card example. Instead of dialing in all the uh, programs like that, I put my code on these cards. This is a card. It's a cardboard, actually. So it is 80 columns, actually, 80 columns. Okay, uh, and for each column, see these are punch, uh, these are holes. I put a hole here, that means that column number two is holding one, the value is one, and the value is two, and for this one, empty, 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 I guess. For this one, it is seven, and there is a special character that I don't know what it is. As you see, instead of dialing those numbers, I feed in this card to the computer. Okay? This is a punch card. Punch cards are not inventions of the computer people. They were invented in 90, in 1800s, actually. In 1800s, 1880s. They used to keep data on the punch cards. And there used to be special devices to read those punch cards and make the data available. Okay, they used to keep their data using the punch cards before the computers, actually. Actually, even before that, let me show you. Uh, can you guys, can you guys uh, click on this?
Somebody's microphone is on. Could you, could you check your, okay, okay, good. Can you guys copy and let me, let me paste it to my chat window. Chat, okay. Yeah, just click on it and I will try to watch it. I will try to show it on my YouTube player. Okay, good. Yeah, this one. Well, it's a two-minute video. It's a two-minute video. And for some reason, it is not playing. I, I guess you started playing it, but I don't. I cannot play it right now. Aren't punch card used as the optic exam is used in turkey like well, well, well with the optic exam uh, readers i mean the, the, you read a mark this is punch there is a hole in there okay it's a hole I in, they, they look for the hole like the, the optic scanner look for the mark optic it's scanner looks for the mark yes punch cards there is a c uh, so let me show you this actually. Uh, can I? Okay, so these are invented in 1700s, I guess. 17, 1800s, beginning of 1800s. Here, okay. These are the patterns for the fabric that you are that you are producing. So if you watch the movie, yeah. See, these are the pins. Let me. Oh yeah, okay. Here it is. These are the pins that checks those holes if those pins fall through then your machine selects some of the lines and some of the lines are not selected you see these are the uh, these are the these are the rods that uh, try to uh, uh, that try to see if there is a hole or not depending on the results okay some of the lines are selected if the lines are selected then your fabric will have a different pattern okay i don't want to play it right now but i like to show yeah, okay here it is so this is what comes out of it they they did this in 18 beginning of 1800s okay so somebody Okay, named uh, the guy named Babbage. He said that if I can do this, if I can produce these kind of patterns out of these punch cards, why don't I use this for computation? Okay, so the first computational machine was designed by that guy, but he couldn't build it because there was no mechanically sufficient gadgetry for building such machines then. But the first computers, design computers, were like, uh, they come out of the textile industry. Okay, so people went back and they say that, okay, we are going to use punch cards to input data and the uh, data and the uh, uh, programs to the computer. Okay, so there is a card reader. Card reader, you, 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 you write your programs. Let me show you the program okay this is your program deck each one is a card okay you at the beginning you put this number there you say that this is my job job number is this and this is my name i want the fortran compiler okay okay you put your number there and then you say i want the fortran compiler this is your Fortran program, a number of cards there, maybe 10, 15 cards. Then you will say, load this and run this, and this is the data for my program, and this is the end. So there may be a total of 100 cards. So 100 cards times 
80 means that uh, this is this is uh, 8,000 8,000 characters of data and program. Okay? So, uh, the, the, and these cards are not small. I think this is like maybe 10 centimeters by maybe 5 centimeters. And they are not that thick, but that if you put them like this, a uh, hundred of them together, maybe it's going to be maybe five centimeters here too. So you need to carry it and you put these uh, cards into card reader. Card reader is a special device. Card reader, okay. You put your cards, this is a deck of cards. Okay, to this card reader, card reader reads it, and as an input output device, it feeds all of your data and the program to the computer. That's what the, what the, that's what happened. Okay, but the thing is that the thing is that although this is faster than faster than dialing in all the numbers. <laughs> I, I don't know, I, it keeps uh, disconnecting me and let me, let me, let me try to disconnect from, I don't wanna, my wide connection is acting up. Let me disconnect my wired connection. I guess wireless will be wireless will be more reliable. I am going to use a wireless connection. So it is faster than using the punch cards is faster than you dialing your programs in, but it is still slow. Why? Because it's a mechanical device and my computer has to wait until all the cards are red. Okay. Until all the cards are red. So one problem with this approach is you need to wait for person to enter all the data and all the programs to, to run the program. The computer itself is $5 million. $5 million is waiting for some person to enter all the data. So you are wasting your, your, your time. That's not a good thing. You don't wanna waste, if you made an invest, investment of $5 million, okay, uh, $5 million, then you don't wanna keep your computer idle for some people to enter the uh, program code, okay? The same problem here, punch cards, okay? Reading punch cards is slow because that make a card readers are too slow. So I am tying up the CPU. I am tying up the CPU. CPU is very expensive. What am I gonna do? I need to find a solution, okay? And for the output, they used to use the printers. So the computers are like this. This is a very expensive computer computer okay this is your card reader it reads the data and the program and your output comes from the other end with the printer okay okay printer produces your uh, output pages card reader takes the deck of cards and this one is Five million dollars. Okay, so people don't like it. People don't like it. What what are we gonna do? Again, I don't have a, a system like operating system. Why? Because all I have as input output a card reader and a printer. Okay, and uh, I don't have anything else, and I don't have enough memory. I don't have enough memory to keep a system like operating system, but they have invented the compilers. So they have the Fortran compiler, Fortran compiler in 1950s. So at least I don't have to write everything in the assembly code or the machine code. I am using a compiler 
and the compiler is within the system but as i said uh, before this is too slow what am i gonna do what am i gonna do this is what i am gonna do okay the answer is this the answer is this this is a very expensive computer five million dollars or one million dollar whatever okay IBM 7094 is a commercial computer okay I am going to use a cheaper computer 1401 a cheaper computer 1401 to read the cards and I will put all the data to a tape drive to tape so this is hundred thousand dollar computer is cheap during those days hundred thousand dollars is very cheap okay so I will use this computer to read the cards and I will put all the data and the program on a tape and somebody will take these tapes okay and they will they will load them to this uh, to this expensive computer expensive but powerful computer since reading the tapes and writing the tapes is much faster than reading the cards if I am wasting any time, I am wasting the time of this 1401, which is a cheaper computer. And for the output, I am doing the same thing too. Okay. So for the second generation uh, computers, input and outputting is like that. And as you see, there is this input tape, uh, tape reader, output tape, tape writer, and there is a system tape. And if I have a simple operating system in there, okay, like loading the programs, okay, and starting new programs and etc or loading the compilers it will be done by this program loaded into system tape okay so that was the, that was the solution so the programmer brings the cards to 1401 this is the programmer puts them in okay 1401 reads the batch jobs onto a tape and then this person operator carries the input tape to uh, 1794 okay 1794 does the computing and the results are written to the output tape and uh, 14 or another 1401 prints the results that that was the that was the idea during those days and let me show you some pictures from those days okay here is the uh, the, the tape reader and writer somebody is installing the tape and these are the stored tapes of the previously run programs and these are air conditioned rooms okay these are the air conditioned rooms uh, very large rooms and these are the special operators you are not allowed to actually see the computers if you're a programmer what you're gonna do is if you're a programmer what you're gonna do is you hand in your deck of cards to the operators you don't see the computers at all so you give this uh, uh program deck program and data deck to the operators okay next day or at the end of the day you get your printouts out okay if you have a simple program like 100 lines of code to be able to see what it prints at the end you need to wait one day okay you need to wait uh, at least uh, uh, one day depending on how the system is busy the, the thing is that this system doesn't care about the user's time but it is very careful about the CPU time because every cycle of the CPU is used efficiently because it's a very expensive expensive machine okay you don't want to keep your <coughs> you don't want to keep your <coughs> computer idle if it is too 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 expensive okay any questions about this uh, second generation second generation computers if a program had an error that we will know only the next day yes even if you have a single line of error a syntax error next day you are gonna get you have a uh, you have an error at line 15 that was the output yeah that's why people don't like it that's why people yeah. didn't like it but I mean they say that there is no other solution I mean if you like to keep this machine to yourself this is what you're gonna do then okay take the machine dial in everything yourself or uh, punch your cards in 
but you need to have five million dollars for that right i mean i'm a i'm just a student right an Under, undergrad student like yourself what am i gonna do okay i need to share this five million dollar computer with ten thousand people in the same university okay they are using the same computer so if i have ten thousand students using the same computer this is the solution they came up with okay this is very fast for those days but i i have to share it so unfortunately you need to wait for a single day for a day to get your results if you are lucky there are no syntax errors okay and there is no interaction by the way there is no interaction uh, you run your program and the program reads all the data and it makes some calculations and prints the results out that's it there is no interaction that cannot be because as you see there are no terminals there is no keyboard okay but there was a keyboard to punch these cards in there is okay card punch machines very noisy big machines but those are not uh, those are not um, terminals okay those are for punching in and for some people uh, especially in turkey i heard uh, i heard stories about this they used to punch these cards using their uh, uh, hands manually with a pin special pin okay you you punch them yourself in so there are many ways you can make mistakes you can make a mistake in writing your program or you can make a mistake in punching your cards okay and there are on top of it there are logical mistakes too so writing programs getting your results was not that convenient during those days okay and other questions was this how they uh, how they went to the moon in nasa or it was a little later uh, well I mean, uh, well this is this is beginning of 1960s after that okay uh, with the uh, nasa uh, the, the apollo computer they had the transistors and they they did something better actually most of the uh, most of the fundamental rules for unix operating the multics operating system were developed uh, by those people actually who work for nasa uh, 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 to develop the apollo computer but the apollo computer was not very capable computer but it was very very carefully designed uh, computer it was a real-time computer and it was using lots of uh, new ideas and in fact uh, the person who developed it um what was the uh, what was i think she she took the uh, turing turing prize i forgot her name uh, uh, her picture is in our lab but i forgot her name mit person uh, apollo computer programs uh, i forgot her name person uh, Margaret Hamilton. Hamilton, yes, Hamilton, yes. She is the one uh, responsible for developing that program. During those days, it, 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 writing software was not that difficult for for some people. They said that she can handle it. She is just a new person. But later they realized that this is a completely new field, and uh, uh, software is much more important than the hardware itself. Okay, so read her story. I think she let me let me let me see what she got uh, Obama gave her a medal like four or five years ago she still lives on uh, awards yeah okay so received medal of freedom she got She didn't have the Turing. No, I thought she got the Turing medal for her. Yeah, okay. This is her taking the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Yeah, okay. So uh, they they invented lots of stuff. No, it is not the punch cards. They they use their own input output methods and. If you watch the uh, Apollo 13 movie, you see uh, the, the display displays are that the, the Apollo computer 
uh, had this special interface. It has operands and the parameters and other parameters, and they call this verb and the subject and object. It's kind of they are using the natural language. So it was a very special computer, and so it it is it is in not second generation but third generation computer. We are going to talk about it in a few minutes. Okay, but many many. I mean, I did not. I started studying computer science in 1988. I did not see these machines, but I had some professors who used to keep a deck of cards, but not punch cards, punch cards, but they did not punch yet. It was all fresh. They used to keep notes on them because all the machines are gone. So I did not uh, see any punch card readers in action. Maybe Erdogan Hoca because he used to work for the IT department of the Boğaziçi University. Maybe maybe he had seen it, but I didn't see it. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so that was the idea. Operator carries these to the 1794 and takes a tape out and puts into the 1401. 1401 is just an input-output computer. Of course, it can do some arithmetic, but it was very... Uh, we computer for in that case uh, but for small corporations they they used to buy this and they use these computers for their own computations okay so i think i am out of time for the first part of the lecture let's take 10 minutes of break after the break let's start talking about the first versions of the operating system actually with the third generation computers starting with 1964 okay let's be here around 12 to 35.
Okay, people. Uh, so, uh, can I ask a question before we start? Sure. So, uh, if there is only one program counter, how are we going to keep track of threads? Uh, are we going to store their program counters in uh, memory? So that's a very good question. We are going to discuss it in very detail in one of the chapters. But if this is your CPU, okay, if there is a single program counter and if there is a single stack pointer and all of these registers, and this is your CPU and you are supposed to, in your memory, okay, in your memory, and you are supposed to run process number one, process number two, and process number three at the same time, right? That means that they cannot run at the same time, uh, uh, literally, but you may time share, right? You run process one, then a little bit process two, then pre process three. This is your operating system area, okay? In the operating system area, you have your table, process table. Process table. In this process table, okay, for each process, you keep your, your register copies. Your registers are copied here. So if process one is running, it is using all these processes, but you keep the registers of all the other processes in this table. When you, from, when you switch from one process to another process, okay, you copy this data from this table to the CPU registers. This is called context switching. Okay, you switch all of your data in so inside your CPU with the stored data so that you can switch from P1 to P2. When, when, when it, when, what does that mean? If you change your PC from one address to another address, that means that you, st you, you start, you're going to start running uh, the program of P2 and P3 and etc. So that, that, that what happens uh, when you run many programs at the same time in your memory. You have a single CPU, you have to time multiplex it. So you keep your data, all the registers and all the related data in this process table. And we are going to talk about it. Okay. But this is going to slow me down a lot, right? Sure. Because I need to fetch, fetch down from the memory. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I mean, this is not going to be as efficient as running P1 all the time. Because context switching is very expensive. It is very expensive, and we are going to see why it is expensive. But we don't have another choice. I mean, if our CPUs are fast enough. If I, if I, operating system is a program, right? I need to keep some CPU time for operating system. Also, I need to keep some part of the memory for the, uh, for the, for the operating system and some part of the disk too. Okay, if my operating system takes 20% of all of my resources, my CPU, my memory, and my disk, I am okay. I am okay. So I am spending 20% of my time to manage resources and to hide away the ha hardware details. Okay, that's the cost of operating system. Some people say that operating systems are like governments. Operating system and government. Think about a country without the government. There is no police. There is no education system. There is no healthcare system. Everybody, whatever uh, they earn, they spend it. They they live their lives and etc. So you might think that this is okay. We don't have any taxes. There is nobody constraining me. I can do anything I like. There is no government, right? So, well, this is not a good idea because who is going to make all those investments? Who is going to make the roads? Who is going to build the, the health system, education system? So we need the government. But if the government is so big, okay, the government is taxing people like 80%. If I am making 100 Turkish liras, I am paying government 80 liras or 90 liras, then I cannot live my life freely uh, enough. So... The, the, so they say that there is a, there is a balance. I mean, the, the governments should be there. They shouldn't be so big, okay? They shouldn't tax you uh, more than uh, half of your wages. 
or they shouldn't be very weak because we need security, right? I need the police, I need the uh, army, I need the uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, business, I need the educational uh, infrastructure and etc. So operating systems are not cheap, governments are not cheap, okay? We pay lots of taxes to the government. But without the government, I, I, you wouldn't have a university like this. Without the government, you wouldn't have an instructor to teach this course because the government is paying me, right? Uh, so uh, operating systems are like that. They, 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 they regularize, they manage the resources, they provide the justice system and etc. We need them. But if they are too big, if they are taking too much resources, okay, if more than 80% of the people in the country is working for the government, then that means that that country is a government, it's not a country anymore. Operating systems are like that, okay? There should be a balance. Okay, thank you. Okay, so good. Um, let's uh, uh, talk about this third generation computers now. People realize that computers are not for computation only. We could use computers to write better programs. That was a, well, may, you may think that this is a very simple idea. No, it is not a simple idea, okay? Before that, what is the name computer? Computer means that it is it computes, right? What does it compute? It computes the trajectories of the bullets. That, that, that was the idea. That's why they are called computers, okay? When they realized that we could use the computer to write better programs, we can have a compiler uh, which will translate a human readable code to machine readable code that would make my job a lot easier or assembler okay or uh, uh, that, that kind of stuff so they started writing their assemblers and in 1955 they invented the first programming language fortran and after that they invented the other programming languages like lisp and etc and then they started saying that what if there is a permanent program in the computer and it is helping us it is helping us uh, to to manage the resources and to abstract away the hardware details so the, the uh, something recognizable as operating system came up in 1960s mid 1960s okay they say that okay what are we going to do the first idea is let's do the multi programming before that we didn't have the multi programming okay this program, this machine, it runs the batch jobs. Batch job means that it needs all the data in, in itself, okay? And it has the, all the program. It runs until it is done, for example, calculating the trajectories of those bullets or calculating a scientific uh, 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 approximation, a numerical uh, approximation, etc. Once it is done, it is done. It doesn't need anything, okay? So it's a bad uh, job. All the things are bad job. They say that uh, it doesn't have to be a bad job, okay? Maybe, maybe I can do this. Let's, let's, let me go, okay. Let's keep the operating system in the memory. And I have job one, job two, and job three stored in the memory. I am going to let job one use the CPU and all the resources. If job one is blocked, what do I mean by blocked? If job one needs a data, some data from the disk or tape drive, it has to wait, right? Because tape drives and the disk drives are so slow compared to the computer. And in that case, I will switch to job two. Okay, I will run job two. If job two is blocked, then I will switch to job three. If it is blocked, then I will switch back to job one, okay? An operating system has to manage this because one of the tasks of the operating system is the management of the resources, right? And CPU is a resource, memory is a resource, and I have to uh, manage it. That was the idea of multi-programming, okay? Idea of multi-programming. Keeping many programs in the memory active all the time, but only one of them can use the CPU and the other computer resources. That was the invention of the third generation, third generation uh, computers. And that was a very big invention. That was a very big invention. Why? Because, why? Because, okay, let's go back. Okay. 
With the multi-programming, you have to protect the uh, programs from itself, so memory protection. Most of the programs stored on this, so they are a little bit faster than the 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 the, uh, the, the, the tape drives, but still much slower than the computers. And then then they say that I don't need the 1401s anymore. Can you tell me why why I don't need the 1401s anymore? with the multi-programming. Remember, we need the 1401s because reading from the punch cards and writing to the printers are taking much time. It was tying up the CPU, right? I don't want that. But with the multi-programming, I don't need the 1401s anymore. Why? Because you have multiple users at the same time? No. It is multi-programming. I didn't say multiple users. I am still doing the ba bad jobs. We, ins we can insert multiple punch cards in machine. How many how many punch cards can you insert? Like, like thousands of them? No. Still, there is only one punch card reader and one printer out. Maybe since uh, the, with the multi-programming, we can store uh, more than one program in our computer. So we do not need to uh, feed the computer after one uh, program executes. But you need to put those programs in, right? Yes. So it's going to take lots of time to put those programs in. Maybe since it's one time, it's not important. No, it is not one uh, time. There are, I mean, there are 10,000 people using the same computer and many of them are feeding their programs every day. It's not a one time thing. Okay, let's think about this. This is my memory. Inside my mail, I have my operating system. Job number one, job number two, job number three, etc. And this is my uh, computers, the CPU. Okay. And this memory and the CPU are connected to a bus. They communicate with each other through the bus. And uh, my card reader is connected to the bus. Card reader. Uh, this is a controller. Electronic device. Controller that communicates the card reader with the computer. Another controller. This is the printer. If the CPU is used to read cards from this card reader and put the data in the memory, CPU is going to wait a lot because CPU is thousand times faster than the card reader or the printer. Right? So we don't want that. That's why they, they have invented a way of 1401s. I can waste the CPU time of the 14, 1401, but I don't want to waste the time of the 7400 7, computers because they are so expensive. But after the multi-programming invented, this is okay. Why is this okay? Because one of these jobs is okay, read cards. One of the other jobs is print output. Okay. When this program reads the card, okay, it will ask the card reader to send a character. And since the card reader is so slow, this one will be blocked. It cannot continue to wait. So the operating system will tell the printer, okay, it is your time to work now. Okay. So the print output will work. 
If it is blocked because the printer is too slow, it is waiting for the printer, then the job three will run, okay? If this one is blocked, then job four will run. That means that instead of making the CPU wait for the card reader or the printer, I can run another program by switching from one program to another program. That is what multi-programming is, okay? Multi-programming does that, okay? With the invention of the multi-programming, I don't need 1401 anymore. I can use the same pro same computer, expensive computer, to read from slow devices, to write to slow devices, and at the same time, do my computation, do my computation. Of course, switching from one task to another task is expensive, but it's not going to take more than maybe 10% of your CPU time to do all of that stuff. Again, operating system is another job on my computer and it has to run from time to time. But there is only one program counter, okay? It is either operating system is running or card reader running or printer output is running or job three is running. One of them has to run at the same time, okay? And if you think about it uh, uh, from a view, you might think that all of them are running at the same time. But in fact, uh, they are sharing the CPU in a time multiplexed way, okay? Sir, is this still the basis of our computers right now? Yeah, this is, this is, in 1965, they invented this and we are using exactly the same thing. We are using, now of course, nowadays our CPUs are not single core CPUs. We have many more co cores, but the main, main idea is this, and we are using this. We are sharing the CPU in a time multiplex way, and we keep lots of processes in our memory, but only one of them is using the CPU at the same time. And we keep switching between the jobs, okay? Whenever they are blocked, okay? All, of course, all these processes has to be managed, okay? Let's say J3 took the CPU and it is not giving it away. J3 says that I need the CPU, took the CPU, and it keeps running the uh, program uh, until infinity. It's in, in an infinite loop. It did not block. It doesn't need any data from the desk. It doesn't need to print anything to the printer. Okay. Uh, it doesn't need any data. So J3, J3 will run for hours, but I do not, I cannot let this happen. So what am I going to do? And since J3 took the CPU and it is running it, right? Over and over and over again. So the invention is this. There is a, there is a device called timer. Okay, it is connected to the system. The timer produces interrupts from time to time. When the interrupt is produced, that interrupt has to be handled by the operating system. So it is a hardware thing. You, you already know about this from your architecture course. Okay, so that, that timer causes an interrupt. Operating system takes control and it says that, okay, I see that J3 used the CPU so much, I am going to stop it now. Okay, so uh, there is the timer interrupt helping me out in this case. And uh, this is called preemption. Preemption. Preemption means that stopping a process from using the CPU when the time is up. Okay, and these are all inventions with the third generation computers. Multi programming, spooling is. Spooling is, there is a question? Yes. Sure. Uh, you say when a, uh, when a process is blocked, uh, the other process starts working. But uh, when a pro uh, process is blocked, it sh for example, it has to read uh, data from disk. But how does that process read data from the disk? It will, again, the CPU should do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very, very good question, Ebru. Um, when I say if a program is blocked, how does a program get blocked? How do you read, as a programmer, how do you read data from the card reader? You ask the operating system, right? You ask the operating system that read this data from me. You make a, uh, for me, you make a system call. And the operating system asks the same question to the card reader. Card reader says that I am going to provide that data to you 
in 200 milliseconds okay? okay so while the card reader controller here is working on that thing operating system says that okay i will block this process because it cannot continue it needs 200 more milliseconds uh, for data to be ready so i will let another one run another unblocked process run okay so every time a process is blocked operating system knows it okay you ask the as a regular program you ask the operating system to do something for you you don't directly go to the card reader or the printer to read something or print something you ask the operating system that's why we say that operating system abstract away the details of the hardware because we asked the operating system also operating system manages the resources okay what happens if more than one process wants to print something okay i printed a character then another process printed another character that, that will mess everything up so operating system has to manage that too okay Ebru, that was a good question i hope you i answered it Yes, yes, I understood. Thank you. Okay, good. So these are these are good questions, actually. And uh, the, this is the reason why the book chooses to go over all the operating system related stuff at the beginning of the semester in the single chapter. Okay, that's why we are talking about the, uh, the, the, the history of the computers, where we started, why we needed these. Okay, let's talk about this time sharing. Okay. Some people did not like the second generation computers at all. Although they are very efficient in terms of using the CPU time, people were not happy. They say that, okay, I have to wait. I think somebody asked you. I, I think some of you asked me about this uh, uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, some people said that, okay, I waited for a day. All I get is a syntax error at line 17 okay it doesn't it, it doesn't have to be this way i mean last year i used to use the whole computer myself i dialed everything in as soon as there is a problem i see the result okay in a few hours i can handle everything but now for a single syntax error i have to wait a day another day another day and for, a, for uh, i have to spend the whole week to get the answer People didn't like this idea. For the third generation computer, they say that, okay, this is what we are going to do. This is what we are going to do. I will give you a, okay, keyboard controller and a monitor controller. You can connect your keyboard to this controller and you can put a monitor to this controller now you are connected to the computer and I can repeat this and I can repeat this many times over like that okay many many times so I connected many keyboards and many monitors to the system. Each one is an input output device. Each one is causing an interrupt. And each job might be connected to a different one of them. So that means that I have many programs running in my memory. I have many input output devices connected to my computer. And they started calling this time sharing systems. Okay. Time sharing systems. With the time sharing systems, each keyboard owner and the monitor owner or the terminal terminal owner thinks that they have their own computer in fact they are time sharing something with somebody else okay this is called time sharing with the time sharing now i don't need to use the card readers or the printers i i, I type in my program and i call the fortran compiler compile it and run it and i see my result on my screen and I don't have to wait for a day to get my results out. That's called the time sharing and it was invented again in 1960s, mid-1960s. Mid okay. And Maltex said that, Maltex, a project at MIT, they said that, okay, this is no different than 
providing homes with water and electricity and telephone service, right? Uh, okay, this is your home. This is your home. Okay, the windows and chimney. Okay, so what does the home need? It needs a telephone. It is provided. It needs water. It needs electricity. It's provided. Also, it needs it needs computation line. Okay, so I am going to provide each home with a terminal and a keyboard. These will be connected to a central computer system. Okay, central computer system or company. And I am going to, as a utility, I am going to provide computational services to the homes in 1960s. So that was the first ideas of the cloud computing. Okay. Remote uh, access uh, and, uh, 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 and the platform as service, etc. Okay. So that was, the, that was the invention of Maltex. So they, they worked on this. There, there are very nice videos about Matics on YouTube and I, I suggest you watch them and uh, they talk about to, to be able to run all of this stuff they had to invent time sharing and of course uh, multi programming etc okay so that was the idea so uh, Matics it was invented in mid 1960s I think some people used it until 2000s same same operating system without any change Okay, without any change. I mean, same core, same kernel, only bugs are patched up, etc. So we will keep talking about Maltex a lot. After Maltex, they invented Unix, and Maltex is multiplexed, multiplexed uh, instruction, something, something, computing service, etc. So Unix said that uh, I am not going to do that much. I am going to only Uniplex stuff. That's why they call it jokingly Unix. Okay, so Unix is a scaled down version of Maltex. Okay, whatever we are doing today is kind of, uh, 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 I mean, re re remote access, uh, uh, cloud services, and etc. Those are ideas were first invented by Maltex, you would say. Okay, so third generation, of course. These are all done with the help of the transistors and the integrated chips. Okay, integrated chips because transistors are getting smaller and smaller. And I put many transistors on the same chip. So my CPUs are getting sp uh, uh, smaller physically, but many transistors are uh, fit on the same CPU. So it is CPUs are more capable and the uh, memories, are, memories are larger. Communications are much better. Okay, so still efficiency is a problem. My computers are very expensive, millions of dollars. I don't want to keep my computers idle. So that was the idea. Let's do the time sharing. Many people are using the same computer at the same time. And they don't have to wait. Okay. So uh, with the technology, people realize that computers are the future in 1960s. So there are many companies now doing it, like IBM. Okay, uh, so we have enough RAM. This beca this became the uh, this became more common, and CPUs are fast enough, more capable. And again, with the Maltex beginnings of the remote access, multi programming, as I talked before, run several programs at once. O of course, there is a single CPU. Nobody is running uh, in reality several programs at once. It seems that way because I am switching very fast between the programs. Okay, uh, since I have many programs at the same time in my memory, I need to protect them from each other uh, for the accidental memory rights or for the bad purpose hacking uh, 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 attempts. Okay, I need to protect it. Who is going to pro provide this protection? Of course, the CPU, the hardware. Okay, uh, when one program needs to do the I/O, such as uh, writing something to the printer or getting a character from the keyboard, it is blocked because you ask the operating system to read a character from the keyboard 
or to write something to the screen, okay? So that process is blocked and the operating system will let operating system will let another program to use a CPU. Okay? If this is my timeline, okay? If CPU is used by process 1 and then CPU is used by process 2 and CPU is used by process 3, between them operating system has to use the CPU because operating system does the switching. Okay, operating system makes a decision to, 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 to uh, decide which process to use the CPU next. Okay. Preemption is here. Okay. So tell me what happens at this point. Could you tell me what happens at this point? Why, why process one is stopped being stopped from using the CPU at this point? Because of timer interrupt? Maybe it is a timer interrupt. Yeah, that's a good thing. A timer interrupt comes in. Timer interrupt causes the timer procedure, which is part of the operating system, timer handling, uh, timer procedures to run, and operating system says that, oh, this is too much time. I am going to stop this one. What else? Timer could happen. A call to the operating system. Yeah. Oh, system call. System. Yes. P1 makes a system call. It says that I need this data. Okay. The operating system takes the operating system takes the uh, uh, control and it it will it will do some stuff or any other interrupt. Any other interrupt. The disk might say that my data is ready. I am going to load this to your memory. So there is an interrupt produced by the disk controller. And that interrupt is handled by the operating system. In that case, program one is automatically stopped. And operating system takes over the CPU and does the handling of the interrupt. It loads all the data from the disk uh, controller to the memory. And then operating system makes a decision. It will either go to back to P1 or it, now this time they say that, okay, I'm going to go to P2. Okay. So this one, this line happens because of either a system call or a timer or a, any other interrupt. Either a system call or an interrupt. Okay. But it will never go to from P1 to P2 directly. Operating system is always in between. Okay. If you look like this is like process P1, process OS, process P2, process OS, process P3, process OS. It will go that way. As I said before, operating system is just a process. It's just a job. It's a prelevit job, but it's a just it's just a job. Okay. Yes. So uh, can it be exception uh, in this point? Exception, I mean, there are many meanings for an exception. If you th if you talk about the exception, like a Java exceptions or C++ exceptions, all the exceptions are handled within this program itself. The, the, the operating system doesn't know anything about the exceptions. But if your program, if your program does a division by zero, Okay, who is going to do the division? CPU, right? Or the floating point unit. And the floating point unit says that, okay, I cannot do that. I am going to tell the operating system that there is something wrong with this uh, instruction. Okay, in that case, operating system will take over if it is programmed that way. And it will let the program know that there is a, there is a, uh, uh, there is a uh, division by zero error with this program. Either it will terminate the program, or uh, if it lets the program know about it, program can can take uh, care of it. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Good. Okay. Let me continue then. Uh, the OSS use demons. Demons are special processes. They always stay in the memory, okay? 
and they are good for printing stuff and reading from the cards. They, they call them spooling simultaneous peripheral output online. Remember the picture that I that I, that that drew I here? Print output, read read uh, cards. These are the demons. These are the operating system jobs. Okay, they are blocked and they are waiting. They are blocked and they are waiting. If the printer, if the card reader says that the next uh, next data is ready, it calls that uh, interrupt. That interrupt is is going to be handled by the operating system. Operating system looks at the interrupt and says that okay, this card reader process is going to take care of it, and it wakes this up. This one takes care of it. It runs, and after that, it says that operating system, I am ready. I read the data. Then the operating system makes a decision uh, uh, on which process to run next. Okay, so these are called demons, and this overall process, overall uh, uh, technique is called spooling, simultaneous peripheral output online. Okay, it could be used for outputs or the inputs. Okay, spooling is a technique which we still use today. Uh, so all it means that there is a special process uh, blocked and waiting for something to happen. I mean, yesterday I showed you my process, right? Let me show them again. Why do I have so many processes running on this computer? They are all waiting for something to happen. If I go that way, okay. Let me go all the way down, the, the, the ones that are okay. Okay, so this one says that device, device association framework private host is waiting for something to happen. So this is the biometrics uh, services. This one is waiting for uh, a camera input or the fingerprint input so that it can verify it and it can uh, let you know. And uh, most of the time it doesn't do anything, it just waits. Okay, because I am not logging it anything. I am not logging anyway. I, I, I am not logging in now. Okay. So this is the the encryption services, uh, some server here, audio universal service. It is doing some stuff with the audio. As you see, these are all demons, and they are waiting for something to happen. And if that thing happens, it is triggered by the key interrupt, and operating system will wake these up. And they will, they will, they will do their job, and they will go to sleep again. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, I think I talked about this integrated circuits and the multi-programming. That's good. Let's go to fourth generation computers after 1980. Most of the stuff after 1980 happened because there are very uh, 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 big developments with the hardware side because now we have integrated circuits but it is large scale to very large scale integration i can put more than one million transistors on the same chip now so that means that chips are so small they have many uh, transistors on it they are getting cheaper so i can build $2,000, $3,000 computers. That's when IBM designed the IBM PC in 1980s. Okay, between 1970s and 80s, there were some very simple uh, computers for the game playing and some home computation, etc. But IBM said that, okay, this is a business opportunity. I will design small computers for small businesses and maybe for the home usage. And I will sign them for one thousand two thousand three thousand dollars okay but i need an operating system for these kind of computers what do i do uh, they ask uh, bill gates the founder of the microsoft uh, 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 microsoft uh, company microsoft um, uh, and microsoft didn't have the bill gates during those days i think he had only a basic interpreter he didn't have an operating systems he said, okay, I will buy an operating system for you and modify it, and I will call it MS-DOS. DOS means dirty operating system. Later, they decided that dirty is not a good word. Let's make it disk operating system. So they call it Microsoft disk operating system, and uh, uh, they, they became partners, 
okay they became partners but as you know the first IBM PC it the interface was like this the interface was like this all you can do is all you can do is all you can do is um, uh, type commands like ls and make the make directory and change directory and etc they didn't have the graphical user interfaces with the pcs because pcs were too too weak they didn't have enough computational power to manage uh, uh, graphical user interfaces uh, but in 1960s somebody named engelbart uh, he invented the graphical user interfaces complete with windows icons menus and etc so long before we started using Windows graphical user interface on personal computers, either or Windows or the uh, the, the Apple operating systems, uh, the the idea were there. Okay, idea were there. In fact, the 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 the, the guy, the Steve Jobs, uh, got the idea when he made a visit to one of the laboratories that was running these graphical user interfaces. Okay, and then uh, people started using Unix variants for the personal computers uh, mac os they, uh, uh, they started using the bst unix for their operating systems and windows nt is very similar to some of the uh, mini computer operating systems of 1970s okay so that was the fourth generation as a the, the software wise for the operating systems there was not much new ideas of course everything is getting larger yeah well, we have to adopt we, uh, we had adopted but the operating system unix that is designed for the computers of 1960s were perfectly good for running on these kind of computers okay and then came the fifth generation computers from 1990s mobile computers computers are getting smaller and smaller and they are making more available uh, Nokia in 1990s, uh, they had this idea, crazy idea of combining a phone, a telephone, a cell phone with the personal digital asset with a computer, okay? And Ericsson, it, it, it called it the smartphone, okay, in 1997. But both Nokia and Ericsson couldn't commercialize this product in a successful way, okay? They went bankrupt. Instead, uh, Apple, Apple, with the iPhone, uh, they launched a very successful uh, smart computer operating system, iOS. And then at the same time, uh, Google launched its own small computer operating system, which is a Linux-based operating system, actually, Android. Android is a Linux-based operating system. Again, we are using the 1960s technologies. With the mobile computers, everything is about uh, security and battery management it is not like my cpu time is important okay if i keep using this computer this one it is a computer right if i keep using this computer 100 percent of the time the cpu time okay i think my battery will last maybe 15 or 20 minutes at most and it will get hot i don't think that is going to handle it i cannot use all of my available CPU power on this computer 100% of the time for a long time. No, it is not designed that way, okay? This is designed for me to use it in an easy way, so the interface is very important. Also, it is designed for the battery management, okay? My battery has to be sufficient for a whole day's work. Otherwise, this is not useful. I mean, if my battery is out uh, in a single hour, then, then that doesn't make much sense. So the the main idea is not now using the CPU time all the time, okay? Or the main idea of the fourth generation computer, it is not CPU utilization, it is for user convenience. Make the job of the user uh, uh, easier, okay? So the user is at the center, that's why we have the graphical user interfaces. That's why most of the time, my usage of this computer CPU usage is most of the time is uh, much lower than 100%. Now it is maybe 50% or something like that. It, th even this one is very high for this kind of a computer, but I am not loading this computer like 50% of the CPU 
for more than or two, uh, two, one or two hours a day. Rest of the time, it just sits idle. Okay, that's not the idea. I mean, CPU utilization is not the idea for the PCs, PC operating systems, or the mobile operating systems. Okay, I think I am out of time. Uh, I may take one or two questions if you have any. Any questions? So go to YouTube and watch the computer history documentaries. There are very good documentaries, especially with the Computer History Museum. There is a YouTube channel, Computer History Museum. Uh, it starts from the beginning and it it, it, it uses some footage from the original inventors of these systems. For example, the, uh, the guy who built the first mechanical computer, I didn't talk about it, the, the Zuse, the German uh, engineer, Zuse, I don't remember his first name. It's a mechanical computer, then he used rel relay computers. Uh, and the first uses of the, uh, first uses of the, uh, relays and the transistors and the uh, the, the the vacuum tubes, uh, the original inventors, and 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 actually, let me let me try to find it. This is very interesting. Just watch the whole thing. Where is that one? The Corbato. Can can I find it here? Not Sutherland. Okay, this is Sutherland. I think I downloaded from YouTube. Okay, this is from... Hello, I'm John Fitch, MIT Science Reporter. We're at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory. MIT Science Reporter, I think this is 1960s, 60s, somewhere. So somebody is... This guy, yeah. See, find this uh, video in uh, Sutherland. Sign this video and watch it. And this is a video from 1960s again. See the graphical user interface. Uh, very good start. start. <laughs> right. In order to do this, we can position this bright spot in the middle, middle of the cross that you notice at a desired location. And we press the button to command the computer to draw a line. It will draw a line from this position where I am now to any subsequent position of my light pen. This is much like a rubber band stuck in two pins. One is nailed on the, on the screen here, and the other is at my light pen. So graphical user interface is trying to design something using the graphics, and this is happening in the 1960s. OK, this is one thing. Of course, watch this one. And But I'd like to show you the other one. The, the Yeah, Corbato time sharing. This is, this is very interesting, too. Again, MIT science reporter stuff. Computer History Museum, and this guy is going to talk. Yeah, this is Corbett. I think he died like last year or previous year. Very influential computer scientist on the operating systems, and he is talking about the first versions of the Maltics. Maltics name is not there, but he is talking about the invention of time sharing. This is the first time people heard about time sharing. See. This, he's using 1790, not 1794, okay. The figures he's drawing is the same figures that I am drawing, right? Yeah. And this is the web, maybe. <laughs> he doesn't call it web, of course. This is the computer. Okay, watch this one. This is so interesting. And this is the, this is the, this is the keyboard that he is using, actually. He doesn't have a terminal. He doesn't have a screen. So he is sending all of these comments using this teletype writer. Okay. So this is his computer. Please type either root or triangle. I do square roots and compute hypotenuses. So you, uh, you give the two sides of a triangle and it calculates the third one. Okay, so 
again uh, uh, without knowing the history you will not understand the computers or the operating systems or the programming languages okay study 1950s and 60s very carefully and lots of things will make sense okay good that's it for today and i will see you on monday have a good day